So Katie, thank you so much for joining me on the Teachers Podcast today. It's a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Um, so we actually met in the school playground. We did. Yeah, a few yes. a few weeks ago because our uh, children are have started nursery. We have uh, nursery class, um, and I got talking to you about um, what you are doing in terms of school leadership. Um, and the research and the study that you're doing around that. Mm-hmm. So I just thought it would be great to get you on the podcast to talk about that, especially with um, the Ofsted framework changing recently. Um, so one thing I like to do is get everyone to give me a background of their journey. So do you want to do that first and then we know who you are? Who I am? Well, um, um, originally I was a teacher for eight years mm-hmm. um, in a primary school in Leeds. But before that, I did a degree in music. Um, oh, many years ago now, in 2008, I graduated. Mm-hmm. And I thought, what can I do with my life? I never thought I'd ever be a teacher. It wasn't the thing that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so I worked in retail for a couple of years and thought, oh, actually, maybe I will be mm-hmm. a teacher. I can't to, to train people, so why shouldn't I go and have a look? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I got in on the merits of having um, music as a degree and playing the piano. They are like, can you play the piano? I was like, yeah, I can, you're in. Yes, that's how it goes, you know. So people get into, <laughs> you know, the interview, they get a job, don't they, based on whether they can play a piano. In my, in my interview into the school I went into, I went in, he showed me around, and he went, play this. And you should know the piano is my seventh instrument out of seven. So I, I'm not like the most proficient player of the piano. Mm-hmm. I had to play a skip to the Luma Darwin, and I couldn't. <laughs> I was like, oh. But I did it and he employed me anyway. Oh, well. And so eight years later, I was still there. And then I left because management changed. And you know when something doesn't feel right, mm-hmm. it's not the same values that you have. Yeah. So I thought, this isn't for me. I'll go somewhere else. And I came into instant money because of various inheritance and things like that. And I went to do a master's in education, in teaching and learning. Got told I should be doing leadership and management instead because I was good at it. Mm-hmm. And I've just finished that. And now I'm starting my PhD in education. The focus on leadership. Okay, so PhD in education. I mean, I'm brave, right? Yeah, honestly, <laughs> when you told me that, I was like, wow. Are you mad? Yes. Yes, but also in awe as well because it's just, I feel like it's just massive. Just this massive thing yeah. to undertake. It is pretty massive. It is. I had my first supervision meeting at university this week mm-hmm. and I sat there and I said to my supervisor, So what do I do now? Now I've done the master's, right? I've got a distinction, yeah, smashed yeah. that. But now I've got to do it by myself. Yes. And as a teacher, you know, hierarchy is is king in schools. Yeah. You know, if you're a teacher, you're just a teacher. You're not allowed to be anything else. Mm-hmm. And now I've got a serious imposter syndrome because I'm a researcher. Yeah. And the dean said to us all, oh, you're all researchers now. And I went, oh, me? Yeah. I'm the same as you? Yeah. And that's really hard. Yeah. I've got to sort of reset, press the reset button and, and go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've been really pleased for you as well. Um, so, you've obviously done a master's in leadership um, in school and yeah. you're <clears throat> starting this PhD. So, what what have you learned about leadership in school? So, the first lecture I ever went to um, about leadership was also the first one I've ever had in master's. And I walked in and after three hours I walked out and suddenly thought, oh, this is what it feels like. This is what leadership should be. Mm. So when you're in school, you know, you see as a teacher, you think, I'll just do my job and, and my boss is my head teacher and, and I'll do as I'm told to do. And then when you go away and you learn something new and you think, oh, maybe it wasn't right. Mm. So I learned that leadership isn't just about the person at the top of the, the school being in charge. I learned that we're all involved in it. Mm. And, you know, if you want to be a successful leader, you have to understand your people. Yeah. And that was the biggest thing I ever took away because where I was working before, that's, that wasn't the case at the end of my career. So that's definitely what I, the biggest thing I learned was. I think that's really interesting actually because um, obviously I was a teacher before I was in school and then I've gone into business and I didn't really know anything about business and then I've done a lot of reading around that, listening to a lot of books and I think in the business world, we're really aware of that, like good leaders... I include everybody and everything, whereas in school, we're just not, I mean, this obviously is not every school, but in my experience, I can see how it was completely different, and yep. maybe we don't think about leadership, or we don't think that's something we need to improve, we improve the curriculum, we improve teaching and learning, but we don't always improve the way we lead. If you look at academies, academy trusts, especially the multiple ones, the really, really big ones. They've got this strong leadership team in place. Mm. 
They have done it before. Like a business. They know how it works. Compare it to local authority school, I've had the same TED teacher for a long time. They, they bear a lot of the weight for that mm. school yeah. because they feel alone. Mm. And that's a dangerous place to be. Um, whereas Matt's have got it, they know how to work it just like a business. Yeah, yeah. So do you think leaders are getting the right CPD then in schools in England? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If I think about the leaders that I know, and as a, I was a middle leader, mm -hmm. um, and you, I went on an MPQML, and what does that teach me? Managing people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't teach you how to lead people. Mm. And you're expected to step up to the role and just go for it with nothing. Yeah. You can do a master's. Lots of head teachers do have master's. But in what? Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Okay. So you're about, well, you just started your PhD. Have you had any thoughts about how you're going to conduct your research? I had to write a research proposal for my PhD, mm -hmm. um, which was hard. Oh, it's 2,000 words. So it's very, very short. Mm -hmm. I've just done a 15,000 word dissertation. You can imagine how to sort of compress it all. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm doing. The official term is an explanatory sequential mixed methods research. Say again? Explanatory sequential mixed methods research. Right, okay. So it's not action research, so I'm not going to go in there and do it. Mm -hmm. um, my days of classroom practice have gone. Yeah. I see myself as much as a researcher now. Yeah. So I will speak to teachers, ask them to do a questionnaire or a small survey. Yeah. That's my initial place to be. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I build on it with observations and or talking to them and having conversations with real people in the workplace. Yeah. So the idea is as sequential is you start from one and you build on it. Mm -hmm. And then mixed methods, it means I can just use data as well as observations. Okay. So it sounds really fancy and big, but actually it's just like questionnaires and stuff. All right, okay. <laughs> so you're doing it by questionnaires. Yeah. Um, so that's good to know. And how will you find the, the people to do that? That's a good question. Of course, I have to think about ethical concerns. In, in social sciences, ethics is a massive thing. It's very different to something like chemistry or physics where you can go in and cut things up and yeah. take bits apart. So I have to wait for ethical approval before I can even do anything, before I can even breathe near somebody and ask them a question. I have to yeah. wait. I've got to find the schools that are remote, find schools that are out there in the wilderness and ask them to even speak to me before I can even think about going there. Yeah, That could be difficult. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're listening to the podcast, there'll be a way to yes, contact Katie. Absolutely. Um, Sign up. <laughs> yeah, if you're interested um, in being part of this research about uh, leadership in education. Um, okay, so obviously there's a new Ofsted framework out. <sighs> yes. What do, what do Ofsted say leadership should be? Now? Yeah. Um, they've essentially read the manual about the research that researchers have done about effective leadership. So is, is that a good thing? Yes, on paper. If I've spoken to head teachers about it, and they said, yeah, on paper it looks brilliant. It's exactly what would matches to our values as leaders. That was a big difference before. Their own values didn't match those of Ofsted. And there was a huge problem because Ofsted would come in and say, well, you're not getting value for money. Mm -hmm. And they go, but I'm more concerned about this. Yeah. Whereas now it's much more on staff well-being. You know, you're looking after your staff, you're developing your staff. And they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, absolutely. So on paper, yes, but we'll have to wait and see, won't we? It's still a bit of an experimental phase. Yes, obviously it's, it's only just started, hasn't it, is it? Um, okay, so I was going to ask you if um, Ofsted are moving in the right direction, and I think that's hopefully yes. I think they are, yeah. I think with the best intentions, they are. But on the other side of it, we're starting with deep dives. How do you justify doing a deep dive if you're thinking about staff wellbeing? It, it's a difficult place to, yeah, to lie in. yeah. It's kind of like there's a section for leadership, but a section for something else as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So what does the research say that effective leaders, should, effective leaders should be then? There's lots of research on, on school leadership. Yeah. Um, there's big players in there like uh, Kenneth Leithwood who have come up with a sort of four ways to do it. And then there's other people who have built on that. So Professor Paul Miller, who is my professor at university, and his colleague, um, Disraeli Hutton, I've come up with eight characteristics built on another foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is to shape a vision of, of success for all. Um, the other one is to um, create a hospitable climate in school, cultivate leadership in others, improve instruction and learning, managing people, data and processes, and modelling expected behaviours. It's all things that they have spoken to head teachers about or they've researched in it's not just an overarching view of what, what should be done. They've actually spoken to people about it. Yeah. And that's what they feel um, effective leadership is. And in school, when I've researched it, without telling them what they 
characteristics are, they've said exactly those things rather than Ofsted's idea, which is interesting. I didn't think I'd ever come out with that result, but it did. Yeah, and, and that is, for me, I feel like that must be a step in the right direction then. Yeah. Do you think, um, do you think teachers should become leaders? Um, do you think, do you think, obviously, you're going to teach him for a reason. Um, it's not obviously one certain type of person, mm-hmm. but it also is. You know, do you think do you think they make effective leaders? Do you think you have to change the mindset to become effective leaders? Do you think there are only a small proportion that could be leaders? You, mm, there's difficult, a, there's isn't an it? argument <laughs> about um, trait leadership and all different kinds of leadership, and I won't go into that because it's a complicated place to be, and you'd, you'd be there for hours talking about it. Um, I I think that teachers can be leaders. They can be, but they need to be very self-aware and mm. know their values and know where they stand before they be into anything else. Anyone can be a leader in their own right. It doesn't matter how where you are in school. So if you're somebody like I was and you had a degree in music and you were given music as your, as your mm. area, I was still a leader. I had to make sure that I was comfortable with myself before mm. I did anything else. Yeah. So it very much depends on the person and yeah. how they feel about it. Yeah, and I feel for me, one of the reasons why I'm asking that question is because of maths. And, you know, there are, well, not e- even just maths, but there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of talk, isn't there, about whether do we actually have somebody at the top who does have teaching experience or do we bring in a business leader, you know, that kind of thing. I strongly feel you have to know. As yeah. a leader, you have to know what goes on. You have to have some level of expertise in there because otherwise you are leading blind. Mm. So if you're going to be a, um, a CEO of business and you want to walk into a school and you want to run it, you don't know anything about education. And the nuance of education is so different. Mm. And the people are different and you've got children in there and they're very vulnerable and you've got parents and you've got community and you've got everything outside of that that you wouldn't necessarily have in a business. It's like a community rather than a business, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. It's a different kind of skill. Yeah. It's almost like it should be, um, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> who, 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 who should look after that? Um, I, I was going to sort of talk about government, but then that's probably not a good thing. Um, <laughs> so, we won't go there. <laughs> yes, let's not go there. Um, okay, so one of the things um, with the podcast um, that I'm quite clear on is that I want it to be um, bring good value for teachers. Mm-hmm. Um So in every episode, there needs to be some value that they can implement. Yes. So if we have uh, leaders listening right now, Mm -hmm. um, can you give me some, uh, maybe one or two examples of something that leaders could be doing for their own professional development now, which is not going to be really time onerous or anything like that? It's tricky because obviously things cost money. Mm -hmm. So... I was working on this quite hard at home to try and find things that were available to them that were quick. So every teacher should be a member of a, of a union. And mm-hmm. if you are not, then you, well, you should be, mm-hmm. even as leaders. So I'm a member of the NAHT Edge, which is a middle leader thing. And they, they offer CPD that's either free or discounted for mm-hmm. teachers and for leaders. Go for it. Sign up for everything. Sign up for um, associations like BERA, the British Educational Research Association. I think for teachers, you get discounted rates. Same, same for Belmas. It's £25 a year, give or take here and there. It's, it's one-time investment for that year. And in that, you can get lectures, you can get audio things to listen to, you can get free journals, you can get to go to London for a nice lecture for free. Mm. Nice. Wow. Nice evening. Yeah. It does take a bit of time. That's one of the problems with it, because, of course, everything is happening all at the same time. And for yeah. leaders, they balance all these plates and spin everything at the same time. And, and often the leaders who still teach full time. Yep. Um, and, and I find it very interesting because, um, obviously, I have a very busy role at Classroom Secrets. Um, and I, I'm i obviously the leader. And I do listen to a lot of books about leadership and mm-hmm. things. And I do do those in my own time. But then I'm not necessarily sitting down every single night to mark books either. Nope. So And you can't listen to an audio book when you're marking books. Um, so it is, it is tricky sort of juggling those two things. The easiest thing they can do is get on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Because the people that I work alongside, the big researchers in the universities, they, they all have Twitter and they share their own work. They share the people's work. And that's a quick way, quick and free way to get access to something. 
because if you're not on social media, I mean, very few people aren't on social media nowadays. Yeah. But sign up for Twitter, absolutely. It's a good place to start. Yeah, and I think Twitter is a great place for all CPD, really, absolutely, rather yeah. than just about becoming a good leader. Um, I feel, I feel like it'd be great um, to kind of have some momentum about um, people in leadership roles in school wanting to be to be better and knowing that there is a way to be better. Sometimes they're frightened to, yeah. to ask or to, frightened to be better because they've had to follow in the footsteps of somebody, sort of a giant before them, if yeah. you like. Yeah. And that can be a scary thing, but you've got to own it. Mm. You've got to be very comfortable. You've got to have your values and be like, right, I'm going to make a success at this. How am I going to do it? And it doesn't have to be like the person before no. either. No, reinvent the wheel. Yeah, okay. Um. So obviously you know there's a life-work balance problem in teaching. Yeah, as, as a former teacher, I'm very uh, yeah. aware. <laughs> do you feel like that is affecting um, you know, a leader's ability to become a better leader? It can, if they feel bogged down by everything. Mm -hmm. Because they've got a huge amount of things to do, especially yeah. with budget cuts and everything. They have to be more entrepreneurial and go out into the community and put their feelers out and get everything. Yeah. So work-life balance is, is tricky. Because when you go home as a leader, even though you might have done 12, 12 hours in the day at school, you're still going to be working. Yeah. Because you have to carry everybody else with you. Yeah. And that's very, very difficult. Yeah, really difficult. Mm. I feel like it's a shame that, um, you know, I mean, some leaders don't get any extra time, do no. they? And, e and even if you do, it's, it's time in school. It's not time to develop yourself and, and not... think about the fact that you're a leader and what does that mean and how do you sort of go forward yeah, it's hard because yeah. it's not real time, is it? It's school time. Yeah, this mm. is it. Okay. Um, so you told me before, I'm going to say this wrong, so I'm going to read it. Um, the NPQML, what's yes. that? National Professional Qualification of Middle Leadership. Hope I got that right. I'd be embarrassed if I didn't. <laughs> right, okay, good. So you did that when um, you were at school. I did. Um, obviously, and learned about leadership. Mm -hmm. Um and then you went on and you did a master's afterwards I did. about school leadership. Yes. You know, how would you compare the two? Well, there's no comparison. <laughs> totally <laughs> different. Middle leadership is a great thing to do if you if you have just finished your like your NQT year and you're in RQC. Go ahead and do it if you haven't ever managed before. Super. It's super experience to look at things. It's a first introduction to research and reading and looking around at things outside of your area. Yeah. Um, but if you want to really look into leadership, then you need to move away from that. There's a National College of Teaching, teaching in Leadership. You can look there. And that's a great next step on from that. But really, there's no comparison between an MA in leadership and, a, and an MPQML. So basically, that one's about supposedly about leadership, but actual leadership is about thinking about yourself as a leader and, yeah. and what your values are yeah. and, and maybe sort of listening to audiobooks and things like that. Mm -hmm. What about um, Simon Sinek? Have you um, read his book, Start I With Why? Know. I think that's... That's good. It, that um, gets you to think about, you know, your personal values yep. and things. Um, okay. So why is improving leadership in schools so important? Because second to quality teaching, leadership has the biggest impact on your pupils. Mm -hmm. On outcomes, of course, we know outcomes is a really important thing, you know, but for them as well. So without successful leadership, you know, what, what can you give to those children? What can you give to your staff? Mm. It's the it's the key to making your school a success, mm. I think. Yeah, and I think you can you can see that in schools that that are more successful. I Absolutely. guess as well, it must be hard for a school to be really successful if um, if leadership's not correct. If you think about a major business, think about um, Ferrari, or the racing yeah. team. If they've had a recent interview with their sort of like big team leader, and he he said. Oh, I, you know, I couldn't do it without my staff. We're yeah. all in this together. Yeah, and that's that speaks volumes, doesn't it? If you've got oh, somebody yeah. who's Ferrari saying this, well, in, in schools it should be the same. Yeah, it's, Absolutely. it's so true. Though. I oh, mean, yeah. Even at Classroom Secrets, like you know, the stuff that's been um, you know developed now, like I don't know anything about that. No. Um, you know, obviously I know about it because they tell me, but that's. All the team, you know, that's because they want to do it. They want to drive it forward. I'm like, oh, brilliant. Yes, I'll help you with that. Yes. Um, okay. So, can you describe a great head teacher that you know? Oh, I can. Um, at the school, I did my research in for my dissertation. And when you walk into the school, from the minute you walk in, you are welcome. And you meet this man. And he's so unassuming. But he's such a cool guy. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, relax, you sit down, there's no pressure, there's no strange hierarchical sort of relationship there. His staff come in and know him, the teachers come in and all the leadership team and the kids come in and he's just a lovely man. Mm -hmm. And he's so welcoming and so open and so honest and so interested in everything outside his office. Mm -hmm. And for me, I walked in there and thought, oh, wow. This is great, absolutely. Even my husband, who's not in education, walked in there as a volunteer and said to me, you need to go to that school yeah, yeah. and see how it's supposed to be done. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you could wave a magic wand, mm-hmm. how would you solve the life-work balance problem? Oh, I'd give teachers and leaders all the time in the world to whatever they wanted. But of course, you know, we can't. Realistically, if I could give them anything, I'd give them time. Yes. Because time is invaluable, absolutely invaluable. That's my answer, you know, as well. Yeah. I'm the same. You know, I think it would work perfectly if you had two teachers per class. One did the mornings, one did the afternoons. Mm -hmm. Um, Because at the end of the day, teachers are expecting to leave at three o'clock. You know, they're not expecting to do nine till three. And even if you had um, those half days, you're not going to do nine till three. But if you could actually do nine till five, then that would be really nice. Yeah, it would. Instead of like, you know, I don't know, 7 a.m. till 10 p.m., something like that. Um, okay, so who was your favourite teacher at school and why? Oh, Mr. Jones in art, but we all called him Bodo, or Bo, because that was his name, because he's really cool, you mm-hmm. know, when you're in high school. He was just a nice man that you could sit down and talk to, and he was like um, a friend as well as a teacher. Mm. And to, to me, that was what I wanted to be. If I look back now and think, as a teacher, was I successful? Yeah, I embodied Mr. Mr. Jones. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> because I was the one that kids were like, Miss, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, come on, come yeah. and sit down. Um, when I was pregnant, Miss, Miss, can we can we touch your stomach? I'm like, yeah, of course you can, yeah, sure, no problem. Open and honest, and exactly what he was. Yeah. So yeah, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I find that really interesting how not only have you described him, but it's kind of your inspiration for who you were as a teacher. I think yeah. that's really lovely. I think it was subconscious as well. I didn't mean, didn't mean to do it, but like I said, like reflecting back on but it yeah, now. Yeah. Wow, then yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Okay. This is a big question. Mm-hmm. Where do you think education needs to go in the next 10 years? <sighs> well, <laughs> where do I begin? They need to... The government need to think about what they actually want to do. There's so much focus on international, you know, lead tables. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it might matter. It, yeah. But you need to think about what you've got to work with. Often it's incorrect as well because they don't actually tell you all the information. So, I mean, I can't tell you the exact figures or anything, but to do with the Shanghai, um, they they don't start formal education till seven so yep. it kind of doesn't compare at all yep look at um scandinavian schools they go into forest school until they're seven and they start yeah. school then and even then it's still forest schools so how can we compare to that our kids yeah. start nursery when they're three in school nursery yeah yeah and, how and do start learning phonics then yeah exactly yeah and we've got to learn that too <sighs> yes <laughs> just yeah. my, my phonics off yeah and i think that the government needs to get it right yeah for my colleagues and my friends Mm. your friends as well yeah yeah and to do their jobs yeah because without that they're still going to be sort of wading through this muddy pile yeah and it definitely feels very muddy as well doesn't it oh absolutely like you're stuck in a pond and you you're trying to get out and you can't i've got friends who want to be teachers all their lives and um, one of them she left teaching or her permanent job to be a supply teacher and she said to me i don't know what else i can do i want to be a teacher i want to be a teacher for so long yeah but where do I go? Because, yeah. look. And, and I think, you know, and this is why teachers, I think, you know, obviously not all teachers, but are staying in the profession for not a long time because just the the, the workload. And I was, um, so I did a podcast uh, last week and it's, it's not out yet. Um, although it might be by the time by the that time this, this is, comes out. Yeah. Yes. Um, and he was talking about some really dark times um, in teaching. And it was at that point when I kind of remembered, I feel like maybe, you know, like when you sort of box it off and think, I don't need to think about that again. Um, and sometimes you, I look back and didn't realise quite how traumatic it probably was yeah. for me. You know, just that constant working every single evening. I used to work all weekend. I probably did 100 hours, definitely. Um, and that's not sustainable. No. And I just think when I remember that feeling now and I think about teachers... 
um, especially if they're feeling that way, it makes me feel sick. If I think about my friends I left behind, my friends and my colleagues that I've known for years, it's in the pit of my stomach starts to churn because I know what I left behind. Mm. And if I could have taken them with me, I would have done. Yeah. And if I think about when I was a teacher, I'd just become a mum as well. Yeah. Um, I went back and I had to work, you know, I believe a house at six in the morning. And I'd come home at eight at night sometimes because the yeah. traffic was really bad on the M62, you yeah. know. And I'd work at I'd work when I got, got home. I'd work at the weekend. I'd never be able to switch off. Your brain's always on teacher yeah. mode somewhere. Yeah. Oh, I'll have that resource, my classroom. Yeah. And that wasn't making me a good person. No. It wasn't doing anything for my family life. No. And because you never take, never turn off, never take a break, that's a huge mental pressure for you. Yeah. But teachers need to know that you have been heard. Yeah. You know, we hear you. Researchers hear you. We know the pressure you're under. We're teachers. We've been there. It's just we've got to make the government hear it as well. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's so important. It's one thing doing the research, but it's it's also making them listen. And I think um, so. Classroom Secrets are actually running a life work balance campaign, mm -hmm. um, and um, in the next few weeks, <laughs> I'm going to be upping um, kind of the momentum of that campaign. So at the moment, we've got about eight thousand um, entries, which sounds amazing. But I want twenty thousand. Oh, yeah. And some of the government um, ones that they've done have got four hundred. And and oh. they just seem deflated the um, the results. And I'm like, where did you get those answers from? Because that's not what I'm hearing. Um, so for me as well, it's like it it's getting the the information, but also getting it in front of the right people to make an impact and having that influential. Yeah, I don't really know the word for it, but you know, it's a kick, isn't it? They need to be yeah. put, put in the right direction because at the end of the day, you're going to end up with burnt out stuff. And that's going to do nothing for your international ratings now, is it? No. Well, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, Ofsted Priorities. Say, yeah, Ofsted say, oh, yeah, we're all about well-being. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But head teachers now have to bear, the, bear in mind the fact that their staff are under so much pressure and then carry it themselves. Yes. That and that puts more pressure on them. And, of course, everything else at the same time. So you have a lot of mental health issues in school. And we've all been in dark places. Mm -hmm. Um I know people that I've worked with, we've all been there. We've all had to sit in the classroom with the lights out in the evening and just think, oh, my God, how am I going to go? How am I going to do tomorrow? Yeah. How, how am I going to get up and do this all over again? Yeah. And that's not what it should be like. No. I remember, um, so when I were in secondary school, I, so I had obviously all that pressure, but then there was a lot of behaviour issues as well. And I was yes. quite young at the time. And um, it was like a three-floor building and the exit on the top floor only had, because it was in a hillside basically, it only had that floor on that side of the building. Okay. Um, so the top floor, you could get in at one side of the building and all the others were facing the other way because it was built into a hillside. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I used to climb like loads of stairs to get out. I used to climb like three flights of stairs because I was um, like really far away from anyone else. And when I opened the door, it didn't matter what the weather was, even if it was pouring down with rain, I would, I would be like, and I would suck the air in like that. I just, I felt like I needed to do that just to like, it didn't de-stress me, but it made me feel better. Prepare yourself for that. I used to feel like I was just, I actually was glad of the drive home. I needed that 25 minutes to just process the day and not think because so much would happen. Just too, too many decisions to make, too, too much processing. A bit like I feel now, but in a nice way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I used to drive home and home for like an hour sometimes too, sometimes more, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'd get in the car, I'd get out of Leeds, I'd get on the motorway and what would I do? I'd cry. Yeah. And I'm not the kind of person that does that sort of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I'd sit on the M621 and I'd be in flood of tears because everything that happened that day, you know, I'd have to process it somehow. Yeah. And the things you have to know, the things you have to deal with. And I'd do it again. In the morning, I'd cry before I went to school. Yeah, do my day, cry on the way home, and it was a repeated pattern for for and, so and, long. And you know what? Wow, mm -hmm. just people don't know this. They don't know this. And no. I feel like there'll be a lot of people listening, going, "I do that. Oh, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not on my own." And you are not alone. Absolutely not. If I tell you anything, anything from being a teacher is that I know exactly how you feel, yeah. and that's the, that's the gap I want to bridge as a researcher is that I've been you. I've done that job for eight years. I've been in a high-pressure environment, in a high-pressure school, in a very challenging area where behaviour's a problem. I've seen it. I've done it. I've got the T-shirt. 
I wear my, my mental scars, I have them. Yeah. And my job and where I see myself is that gap between mm. what researchers say and what you are saying because mm. I am that person in the middle. Yeah. So we hear you. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been there. And and I think the key, the challenge is as well, you know, so there's, there's that element, but like we said before, the challenge is then making that research mean something yep. um, and, and having action taken on it. Um, okay. So, wow, that was a really nice discussion. <laughs> I like that. Um, so who is your inspiration within education then? I've got his name dropping. Professor Paul Miller mm-hmm. is a man who essentially changed my life, as soppy as that sounds, and he knows it. Um, he's now left university. He's going to be my supervisor as well for my PhD. Mm-hmm. And I met him and he walked in and I was terrified because he's just like, you know, really important professor. And he said, this is the only time you're going to see a PowerPoint in my session. The rest of the time we have to work. And I was like, <gasps> but then he knew so much and told yeah. me everything. And as a former teacher himself from Jamaica, moved to London, taught in secondary schools in London. And he knew so much and he... He spoke to me, he spoke to my inner teacher mm. and said, you know, this is how it should be. Yeah. So he's my actual inspiration. All my work, if you ever read it, it'll have Miller references in there. So sorry. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah absolutely. It's my inspiration. Okay, thank you. Um, and last question then. What did you want to be when you grew up? A musician. Definitely. But and that's why you play seven instruments. That is, yeah, well, I went to university playing three and left playing seven because you pick them up. No, that's amazing. Awesome. What do you play then? Oh, God, all kinds of things. Clarinet, flute, saxophone, piano, ukulele. Yeah, wow. taught myself that for primary school. I sing, bass clarinet, but they're all related, so it's all yeah, interchangeable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, have you an um, instrumentalist in your school? You know, sign me up. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> right, okay. Well, all that will be in the show notes, yeah. like how to book you for yeah. piano yeah. playing in assemblies. Yeah, I can play Skits with the really well now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've practising that for years. <sighs> Part of my skills. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been so thank interesting. You. And um, I'm excited to see what you do in the future. Uh, maybe we should schedule uh, you coming back on when um, you've got a bit more research. And if you are interested in um, sort of working with Katie on some research, then please do get in touch. Absolutely, yeah. I'll come back in a year. We can catch up. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.